you in Europe and good morning to those of you in Australia. Welcome to session seven of the ESIG 2021 Spring Technical Workshop. We have another great session lined up for today, looking at what's going on in the wonderful world of energy storage. I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of ESIG, and I will provide a few brief opening remarks. As you know, our spring workshop sessions are all being held online and are open to everyone. The workshop was planned with the input of our ESIG Offerings Committee, chaired by Bethany Fru of NREL and Julia Matoivasan of ERCOT. The committee consists of the chairs of our six working groups and several of our board members. We have a great set of volunteers who really make ESIG what it is, and we encourage you to become involved if you're not already. Regarding logistics, I would like to ask you to note that the webinar will be 90 minutes long. We had a lot of feedback that our one hour workshop sessions were too rushed. So we're experimenting with some longer formats for the spring workshop. Our revised format today will have three individual presentations of approximately 20 minutes each in the first hour, followed by 20 to 30 minutes of Q&A after the last speaker. As we're doing with all our webinars now, we'll be using the Slido platform for managing the Q&A, not the WebEx platform. You should go to slido.com on your device and enter ESIG23 as the event code to ask your questions. Please be sure to indicate the person to whom you're addressing the question. <clears throat> the instructions are also in the background slide for the webinar and you'll be reminded by the session chair. You'll see a thumbs up button next to the question on Slido to allow you to vote on prioritizing the questions submitted. So please keep the questions coming during the presentations and we'll address them at the end. Recognizing the limitations of a webinar with more than 100 people on the line, the lines will be muted. So again, we ask you to use the Slido platform to ask your questions with ESIG 23 as the event code. Today's session deals with energy storage developments where the changes are coming fast and furious. Looking at a future where more and more of our renewable power plants are going to be hybrids with battery energy storage, which continues to grow by leaps and bounds. This is clearly an important topic as we move into the energy transition. This session will be chaired by Bob Zavadil of Enernex. Bob is an old friend, a familiar face at ESIG, and well known to many of you. We're very happy to have him here with us today. I asked Bob if he would mind sharing with us as part of the introduction, some memorable conversation from the past, which we might all find interesting. He said the one he remembers the most is one that he and I had many centuries ago about what a millstone energy storage was around the neck of renewables. I just can't seem to remember that conversation. Bob, we appreciate your participation and I'll now turn it over to you and give you a chance to set the record straight. <clears throat> well, Charlie, you not remembering conversations is nothing new, <clears throat> but I will try to uh, set the record straight. If you go back 20 years, ESIG was known as UWIG, and it was a place to be for commercial wind projects that were popping up around the country. <clears throat> wind was, at that time, relatively expensive compared to conventional resources, especially natural gas. So <clears throat> in all the good work that was being done, there was this overarching question regarding wind. Would, would this ever really happen? Well, it did happen. The cost of wind generation continually improved against other options. Solar PV, of course, was way too expensive at that time. So it received <clears throat> what I call LCOE weighted attention um, in the forums. But that changed seemingly overnight and sent UWIG through some branding con contortions to try to open up the tent. Does anybody remember USWIG? which was one of the alternatives to UVIG, which was the rebranding of UWIG to incorporate solar. So all through this time, storage was always lurking around the twice yearly get togethers at, at ESIG. But as we all know, it was way too expensive. The technologies weren't ready for prime time. Um, Hydro-based storage was too constrained. New but proven pump storage was way too expensive, yada, 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 yada. So if I look back on my four decades in the electric power industry, there's been some interesting times. I started during the last vestiges of utilities as construction companies in the late 70s, where you had to double production and delivery capacity every decade. 
uh, to this period of no demand growth where utilities didn't know what they should be doing anyway, to the emergence of competition, and then to the advent of renewables and the subsequent explosion that we've all seen. And we know that it's far from over as we now unashamedly talk about 100% clean electricity and even full decarbonization. Can that really happen? Well, <clears throat> if it did, it won't be my father's electric power infrastructure or even mine, it will require technologies across the board. The notion of storing electric energy has always been recognized as transformational, um, but till very recently, not achievable on a scale large enough to make a, a broad um, sort of national difference. <clears throat> we know now that that is changing. And that brings us to our panel. Charlie was remarking in our warm up <clears throat> that we have three presentations and they all look at storage from a different perspective. And all the perspectives are, are certainly legitimate and will be part of the, uh, the path going forward. So to get on with things, our first speaker is uh, Rick O'Connell, who is the executive director of GridLab, a national nonprofit that delivers technical assistance to advocates and regulators, uh, provides a connectivity platform to facilitate knowledge sharing, and provides education on best practices for complex grid issues. So Rick, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Bob. I appreciate the uh, introduction and the introductory remarks. Um, yeah, this is this is not your father's power system. Is that the? This is not your grandfather's power system. Is that the? Is that the quote of the day? Um, yeah, as Bob said, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Rick O'Connell. I'm the executive director of GridLab. Um, GridLab is is closing in on its fourth birthday. We're a, a nonprofit that provides expertise around the grid transformation and work. I work closely with ESIG. I actually also sit on the ESIG board. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here and it's a real pleasure to be speaking with you. And as Bob said, we have three really different presentations. And I think that just goes to show that storage is this, you know, Swiss army knife to use an old phrase. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, a specific project and, and uh, sort of maybe reveal a little bit about what we're thinking about with storage. Um, through the lens of a case study. So I wanna talk about the Oakland Clean Energy Initiative. Um, this is a project that's in my backyard. I sit in the San Francisco Bay Area. Oakland is a large city across the San Francisco Bay from San Francisco. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about an introduction, You know, just talk a little bit about the case study, but what I really wanna do is talk about how, how we can better integrate storage into our planning processes and how we can figure out ways to sort of unlock uh, and how we can do better um, with plugging storage, this new kind of asset class is, that's so flexible. Um, so let me just give you a little bit of background. It's a, a 1970s uh, jet fueled power plant um, in downtown Oakland, California. Um, it's owned by Dynagy Vistra. It's about a, it's 165 megawatts. It's Three units. I heard it's thirty-three thousand heat rate. So it's this, you know, basically, you know, Boeing seven hundred seven jet engines. Uh, so old aeroderivative turbines. Um, it runs really just a handful of hours a year. It's it's critical for grid reliability. Um, you know, under a n minus one minus one contingency event, uh, if if transmission into the Bay Area fails, it's in a load pocket. Obviously, um, the plant has an RMR reliability must run contract. I mean, it really only runs a handful of hours a year, but when it does run, it's it's dirty, noisy, um, you know, and impacts a, a low income uh, and community of color. So, you know, the the CAISO, the California Independent System Operator, is the grid operator in California, wanted a solution. PG&E, which is the transmission and distribution owner um, in the, in Northern California, wanted a reliability solution. And then a new entity, uh, East Bay Community Energy, which, um, for a time, I actually served on the community advisory board. Um, you know, so that's the local load serving entity, or which is a community choice aggregator. Um, you know, they needed sort of uh, local resource adequacy. So, here's the challenge. And here's just a quick picture. You can see of the of the uh, unit. It's in the in the building. You can see the stacks. You can see it's adjacent to a substation, so it's got good transmission connectivity. 
Um, so what, what are the potential solutions? Um, and I think this is, you know, goes to the planning constructs that we think about. So is this generation, right? So could we put a peaker, a gas peaker in here? Well, gas is not really compatible with, you know, air, air permits in the Bay Area, um, air quality management district. Uh, gas generation is not really compatible with California's greenhouse gas goals. Um, and obviously the KISO I could identify, we could do a 230 KV upgrade. We could do some kind of transmission upgrade. But that's not only expensive, but also permitting very difficult in such a dense urban area. So what happened was, is that um, I think the KISO uh, did a really good job of identifying the need and being very specific about um, what, you know, what solutions could fit this need. Um, and then PG&E uh, teamed up with the, with the uh, LSE, um, so that's EBCE, that's the load serving entity again and did a joint RFO um, looking for an all source solution. So they, you know, potentially it was, could be demand side solutions like targeted energy efficiency, as well as storage. And then, um, you know, based on the results that they got, um, you know, the solution really turned out to be storage. So in, in, about a year later, PG, both PG&E and EBCE executed contracts with Vistra, um, surprisingly the the asset owner of the of the existing facility, for a twenty for a four hour storage, twenty megawatts, eighty megawatt hours, um, and interestingly here, PG&E's uh, the product that PG&E got was reliability, um, which is really kind of transmission contingency relief, and then. East Bay Community Energy, the load serving entity, uh, executed a contract, executed a similar contract with, for the same, with the same battery, same owner, but for a different product, resource adequacy. Um, and the project's going to be front of meter. Um, you know, it's going to be distribution interconnected, even though it's really adjacent to a substation. Um, and then in 2020, so then last year, the project was increased when, as Kaiso did additional studies and sort of increased the need, um, and PG&E added a added another battery in the Oakland load pocket, a seven megawatt, twenty megawatt hour, um, and all of this is expected to be online in in just a little under a year in January of twenty twenty two. Um, but it was interesting here that the sort of the demand side options weren't selected. Um, and other options like a you know behind the meter virtual power plant um, was also not uh, selected as 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 part of the solution. And then I you know I, I talked about this a little bit, but the structure and the business model is a little bit you know interesting. And I think this is where these projects are are interesting. Like you think about examples that we have of like uh, the Brooklyn Queens demand management project. Um, so you have a, you know, this battery is doing two things at once, right? It's providing local resource adequacy for the load serving entity. And then for the transmission owner, it's providing a product, um, you know, that's called local reliability, uh, which is, you know, not perfectly, not super well-defined. Um, and then there's some, you know, there's some guardrails around making sure that the state of charge um, is kept high so it can actually perform. Um, as a, as a transmission contingency when it needs to, um, which all, 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 of course also is gonna limit the battery participating in like, you know, energy arbitrage or doing other services, but it's still providing here at least dual services and being contracted to, to two separate owners, which is I think interesting. So the thing that I think is, important here is like, how can we replicate, like, how can this not be a cool case study that took probably on the order of five years from kind of initial studies to actual, you know, hopefully COD early next year. Um, you know, so do our planning processes, like the, especially transmission planning processes, allow for these kinds of projects? So, you know, Kaiso, I think, in their transmission planning process has done a very good job um, of identifying places where creative solutions like storage could solve what we normally think of as transmission issues. Um, 
and but then you know because i think in many cases we are quick to use storage to solve generation problems um, especially to replace peakers um, but we're less you know i think our transmission planning processes uh, are less updated to sort of consider storage as, as a as a um, as a solution and then you know in we have these regulatory and planning roadblocks between generation and transmission which mean that it's actually quite difficult to do what we did here um, what pg&e and ebce did here in oakland which is dual contract sort of dual use right so if the um if the storage is doing a transmission function could it also do some other function um, potentially ancillary services potentially provide capacity or resource adequacy um, and so thinking more kind of holistically uh, between the transmission process planning process and the and potentially the generation planning process I think is going to be really important um, so uh, and I and I think going forward we need to start thinking about in, incorporating storage so this is not doesn't have to be such a custom um, specific you know what we'd call a like bespoke project um, that takes a lot of energy and time um, so with that, I think I'm, you know, happy to answer questions at the, at the end. Um, but I just wanted to introduce introduce this example project and and hopefully spur some people's thinking about how we can update what we're doing uh, across the country and potentially across the world to take make better use of this asset. Um, so, with that, Bob, I will pass it back to you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Rick. As Charlie mentioned, we're doing all questions after the three panelists have concluded their presentations via the Slido app, and I'm seeing questions come in, but we'll defer those uh, for a little bit here. Our next panelist is uh, Pierre Oliver uh, Pino, who is a professor at the Department of Decision Sciences at HEC Montreal, and he holds the Chair in Energy Sector Management since December of 2013. He is an energy policy and management specialist with a focus on electricity reforms. So, Pierre Oliver. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'll present on um, hydropower as a storage option. Of course, I'll be talking about hydropower with reservoir. Uh, and I'll take a, a bigger picture. So, so if, as you know, and as, as it's been discussed already, uh, storage is, is useful for uh, many types of application, the milliseconds application or uh, seasonal application. So we'll be dealing with the more seasonal application, although the uh, hydropower can, of course, be used on a daily and hourly basis. So my, um, my storyline for my presentation is the following. Uh, storage is key, as everyone knows, for renewable energy integration, but it's often discussed uh, independently of transmission and hydropower reservoir. So, so that's why uh, that my main motivation is really to refocus uh, or, or to add to the, the storage debate this hydropower reservoir, which can play a big role. Um, dams and, and their reservoirs store water. You all know that there's a, a lot of potential energy that is stored there, but they're usually not considered in storage systems. So, so, so that's in a way in a paradox, and I'll, I'll be bringing up some numbers uh, because these dams do represent huge storage options. And then I'll present a few some results from a Northeast case study. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in Quebec, Canada. Uh, we do have a lot of hydropower. Hydro Quebec uh, does store a lot of um, of, uh, of uh, power in its dams, 176 terawatt hour of storage. So that can be used for renewable energy integration, and that's basically the case study I'll present and I'll share to you. Uh, there's a lot of uh, literature on on renewable integration and storage. So I, I just show here a few. Uh, a, a few studies that are very interesting and very good, and I'm not saying that you know they are not focusing on on the right issue, on correct issues. Uh, it's extremely important to have storage for uh, renewable integration. But if you look through this literature, usually 
you know, uh, hydro is, is not really mentioned and when it's mentioned, it's for pump uh, storage hydro, which is, of course, uh, very important. So, so uh, here you see from the global energy storage database. Uh, so that's the worldwide installed uh, and operational uh, storage options and what is also announced and what you basically see here is that uh, in the usual list of uh, storage technology is uh, pumped hydro storage is there and it represents almost well, almost the entirety of uh, of the storage uh, currently available and also the announced uh, storage options uh, but hydropower in reservoir is not mentioned so that i think is a is a big hole uh, and it's usually it's probably uh, linked to the definition we use of storage and here i show the definition of storage that FERC is using in its order uh, 841, uh, a resource capable of uh, receiving electric, electric energy from the grid, storing it for later injection of electricity back to the grid. And it is, it is back to the grid that, um, that that's our, or the receiving option that's in reservoir, you basically don't directly receive electricity, you just keep the water for a later use, for later injection in the grid. Uh, but even some of the storage options that are mentioned usually, like the thermal uh, options, uh, thermal storage option that is usually included in these energy uh, storage options technologies, uh, thermal storage usually does not, you know, provide energy electricity back to the grid. It's only stores heat or or, or cold uh, for later use in a building. So so even by the definition that we most commonly use. Uh, some of these technologies don't don't qualify, so that's why I would advocate for you know uh, really looking to, to really look at uh, energy storage systems where you can uh, you know use some energy, keep some potential energy, and then then uh, get that energy back when needed. Uh, and that is very important because there are uh, a lots of dams around the world, and these dams store a lot of water of water. So so here you see. You know, you know, the 15 uh, biggest uh, cap dam capacity in, within countries around the world. So Canada uh, with uh, China, Russia and the U USA and Brazil they are the top five hydropower producers in the world. And they are also the top five uh, countries with, with the largest uh, water behind the dams. So here you see these uh, huge amounts of, uh, of uh, cubic kilometers of water stored behind dams. So that's actually the capacity of these reservoirs. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is a huge amount of, of water. And when we actually try to translate that in terms of energy content, uh, with a student, we've done um, we've done the, the analysis for Canada, and we've came up with you know this analysis. With we, when we look at all, all the all the, the hydropower dams across Canada, and we basically try to estimate the amount of energy this dam uh, actually store or the, their capacity of storage. And these of, of are of course only estimates because there are lots of of uh, issues and we cannot directly you know use these numbers as as real uh capacity numbers to, for the amount of energy that is stored behind these dams but when we look at uh the capacity there's huge there's a huge amount of energy that can be stored uh in these dams uh especially in quebec uh you can see more than 200 terawatt hours of uh, energy that can be stored. And when you look at the total energy uh, that can be stored behind dams in Canada, you know, it's uh, 242 terawatt hour. Uh, that's much bigger in terms of storage capacity than the 1.6 uh, terawatt hour of uh, energy that can be stored in the currently existing or announced uh, storage capacity across the world. So the paradox is that at the same time as, as we're talking about renewable energy integration and we stress the the importance of storage the key already available storage that is there is seldom discussed and 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 then even less uh, integrated in the analysis of how it could be used to integrate um, uh, options so uh, well renewable options so of course you know this this storage is really uh, location specific and and you know in some places you don't have access to these dams and 
and then that's that's an issue. Uh, but you know, the, the when we're trying to plan the energy transition and the decarbonization of our grids, we we need to look at all of the options and all of, all of the possibilities. So this is really why I think it's really important to stress the the idea that there's a lot of hydro reservoir storage available already built that could be uh, used and and and. And and hell and then it could be used and to to integrate more uh, energy uh, from renewable options. So that brings me to uh, the northeast case study I want to illustrate. Um, and and you know to just just give you a general background. This is the um, this is the NPCC region, the northeast reliability coordinating council region. Um, with uh, Quebec, Ontario, and, and some of the Atlantic provinces uh, in, on the Canada side, and New York and New England on the US side. Um, and as you can see, you know, the New York and New England uh, regions have a high population uh, and, and some installed capacity. You see the, the installed capacity in gigawatt uh, expressed here. And, and you can see Quebec here with a small population of 8 million people, but uh, with a, a huge power cap generating capacity, 45 gigawatt uh, of installed capacity, uh, 40 uh, of these gigawatts are hydropower with reservoir, most of it with reservoir, there's run of river also, but it's mostly of reservoir and, and almost five gigawatts of wind. So uh, huge, huge entirely renewable capacity that could potentially be used to integrate more renewable in the Northeast, in Ontario, New York, and New England. Uh, and and you know, in this case, it would make a lot of sense, especially since New York official and, and New England, most of the states of New England have official decarbonization goals and renewable energy goals. New York wants to have um, forty percent of its uh, energy, seventy sorry, seventy percent of its energy from renewable sources by twenty thirty. Uh, that is uh, an extremely ambitious goal for twenty thirty. 70% uh, of its energy uh, electricity uh, coming from renewable sources and doing it alone will will be extremely expensive. So, um, so this is really, uh, and the case study I'll show is really a case for, uh, for um, a call for action to, to look regionally at how that storage can be used. And then my case study is just, you know, providing some, some, some numbers on the benefit. So just to give you an idea uh, of the existing storage in that uh, NPCC region, the Northeast region, um, there is a lot of pump hydro in New York and New England. There's also some electrochemical uh, installed capacity, both in uh, New York and New England and in Ontario and Quebec and the Atlantic provinces don't actually don't have any uh, pump storage or, uh, uh, or, or any other type of, um, of the storage options. But if you add reservoir here, then this picture, so you keep, we, we keep what is installed in New York, New England, and Ontario, but if we add the reservoir storage, then the picture changes totally. So we almost don't see here <laughs> the amount of storage available in New York and New England, and you see the amount of storage that is available in Quebec. So this is really the, the, the 170 terawatt hour of storage that are available in Quebec. And these are, you know, from huge dams that already store water for the Quebec needs, uh, multi-year storage in case of, uh, uh, of, of low, uh, low rainfalls, then Quebec can rely on, uh, on that storage to supply its, uh, its power needs. But for now, it's been planned only for the Quebec use and not for the regional use. But that, you know, that, that kind of planning and operations of, of dams could change if, if we were, you know, we were designing the system and markets in such a way that that storage could be uh, used to integrate more renewable. So if we actually try to think in terms of let's decarbonize this region and let's, uh, and let's use transmission to access uh, the, the potential storage in, in Quebec that is already existing, then what happens in terms of cost? So we've done we've done some modeling with some uh, some uh, student postdoc uh, students here at uh, HEC Montreal, and uh, so that is a recent paper that just published in Energy Policy, and I'm just showing you a few uh, key results. So let's imagine that each region is not trading with no region, and uh, and and here you see the yearly cost 
uh, in terms of investment in um, in new capacity, renewable capacity, new transmission line. If you if we allow for new transmission lines, so or, or not. And and basically, what we see is that if you don't trade anymore, so if we really take a, a, a self-oriented approach and we don't want to trade at all, so we even go at uh, you know we even cut uh, our ties and inter ties with uh, with neighboring regions. Uh, the, the, the regional cost, the entire regional cost for 100% decarbonization. So here you see the cost, you know, for different levels of decarbonization. But if you want to reach deep decarbonization and want to reach 100% decarbonization and you don't allow trade, so basically the yearly investment cost where you would have a lot of wind, lots of uh, solar, and then some storage uh, is 35 billion a year. Uh, then if you just use the existing transmission lines, uh, and do the regional trade, uh, but with no new transmission, just the existing transmission lines in the Northeast, then you reduce the, uh, the decarbonization cost uh, to about $22, $23 billion. And now if you build additional transmission lines, so you basically allow that storage to be used to be able to shift uh, electricity from Quebec to uh, New York and New England when there's no wind. And when there's wind in Quebec, in, the, in the New England and New York, you shift back some energy to Quebec. So you are able to balance your system on an hourly, daily basis, and of course, seasonal basis. Then if you allow the, this shifting to happen, then you reduce your total uh, decarbonization cost to slightly more than $10 billion a year. Uh, that's the optimal transmission uh, setting that you need, and that's including the investment cost in new transmission lines between the different regions. So, so of course, that is uh, that you know 100% decarbonization involves a lot of new transmission. It involves uh, a, a different use of the storage in, in reservoir that would happen in Quebec. But would decrease cost in in, in the in, well in all regions, especially in the U.S., where most of the investment in wind and uh, solar would take place in New York and New England. So what's very interesting here is that that storage and hydropower uh, storage is actually very good for wind, uh, for wind penetration. Uh, so so it's really an ally of wind uh, producers. Uh, when we have more transmission, with more transmission, hydro wind correlation goes down to, you know, from zero, the correlation goes down to minus 0.28, really showing how hydro uh, behavior is changing, hydro production is changing to be decorrelated with wind, so that when there's wind, there's that hydro, and then when there's no wind, and uh, there's more hydro. It allows more wind to penetrate in the system. So in our results in the region, we move from 100, 102 terawatt hour to 120 terawatt hour of wind in, in, a, in an integrated with optimal transmission system. And wind curtailment is dropping to almost nothing because basically you can always find some room for wind within the market. And that's how the storage is happening. It's not that we store directly wind energy. It's that we are saving water in the dams to let the wind be used because there's transmission to spread the wind everywhere. What's very interesting about uh, this kind of setting, and although that kind of setting is, is quite specific to Quebec to some extent, because that's where most of the, uh, of, of the storage, hydropower storage is available, I know I'll show that there are multiple other options uh, in uh, throughout the states, but um, but for the northeast, what we can look at, uh, when, and if we, have, we go into more detail, if we just say let's only invest in wind and solar only in the U.S. and well outside of Quebec, so you basically uh, allow wind and uh, solar PV. Uh, investment in Ontario, the Atlantic provinces, New York, and New England. But if you don't allow any transmission with any new transmission with Quebec, then you can decarbonize, but then you'll have uh, well, a lot of wind and solar, and it will cost you uh, $20, uh, $20 billion per year to, to decarbonize. Now, if you again add this transmission capacity with Quebec, and you, you add a lot of transmission capacity, 16 gigawatts of new transmission capacity. Currently, Quebec is interconnected with New York, New England, and its neighbor, and there's around 7 uh, gigawatts of interconnections with the neighbor. So you more than double 
um, the, uh, the, the interconnections with neighbors. That allows even more wind and more solar uh, options to be integrated. And why do you integrate more of that wind? Because you don't need as much storage and also you don't need as much renewable natural gas because in that, in our model, we have a renewable natural gas that, is, that can actually be used in some hours when there's no wind, no, uh, no, no sun. Uh, but then if you allow transmission, you have more, uh, you, you decrease renewable natural gas, you remove the need for storage to zero and you, so you overall have a, a more wind, more solar, and you decrease the overall cost. And the beauty of that is that, you know, none of the investment is happening in Quebec. So Quebec is only used as a battery. So I don't show you here the numbers in terms of how much energy is shifted to Quebec and goes out of Quebec, but it's really going, uh, it's really a, a flow in bi-directional going to and out of Quebec, uh, taking advantage of the available reservoir. So huge savings. Uh, and, 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 and really in favor of, in, of in, could be in favor of investments in the states for the wind and solar uh, uh, industries in the US. Uh, but of course, uh, before we're getting to that kind of system, which are totally realistic, because here we're not talking about, you know, new technologies that could come online. You know, all of these uh, technologies are already available. Uh, it's really a matter of, of uh, organizing the market to get there. So the challenges to overcome, to get there, are really uh, joint regional planning. You know, there's no regional planning happening uh, in the NPCC region uh, right now. Uh, the NPCC used to have some kind of uh, meeting to have regional planning uh, beyond reliability issues, uh, but that's, you know, these meetings are, are as well, if they are still happening, they are happening in total secret and don't have any kind of of a tooth to uh, to actually uh, make a change in the region. So there's definitely there has to be some regional planning. There has to be some uh, common market rules to to make sure that that you you we would have some kind of uh, of, of of markets to be able to trade. And of course uh, that would happen for more corporation uh, shared capacity constraints, uh, adequacy constraints. So so more sharing uh, should happen. Uh, we could think of creating an energy imbalance market to, to foster this kind of, uh, of trading uh, in real time as the West has done and is still not happening in, in the Northeast. Uh, transmission investment, you know, that's part of the re regional planning. Transmission investment should be uh, planned, you know, thinking about this kind of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, flows uh, going to the north and back to the south. Uh, currently, we look at uh, New York and New England, they're planning for 9,000 megawatt of uh, offshore wind, uh, you know, offshore of New York and offshore of um, Massachusetts. But, you know, these 9,000 megawatt will be a lot of wind and when they'll be producing uh, at, at low demand hours, where will this energy go? Uh, you won't be able to build enough uh, storage uh, within New York City or around Boston to keep to get all of that energy. So you need these transmission lines to flow the energy up north so that you know you can get the energy back to the south. Uh, I, uh, that, that, that is not my last slide because what I wanted to show you is that it's not only a Quebec story. Uh, there's a lot of hydropower in the US, you know, 80, 80 gigawatt of hydropower in the US, but by design, and you all know that, but sometimes we tend to forget that most of the hydropower in the US is federally owned by corporations uh, that, that only, you know, that cannot make money out of their hydropower. By regulation in the US, all that federal hydro and most of the state hydro have to sell and uh, at cost. So basically, they're really oriented towards uh, an old system there where they don't try to make money. They don't try to serve the whole system, but they only try to serve their uh, customers at the lowest cost. So most of the hydro in the US is actually not used in the framework that I just described, how to integrate more wind, how to integrate more solar. It's really used in a way that is a traditional way that they've been designed for. And I know there are a lot of constraints on how you can use hydro 
uh, in, because there's a lot of regulation and there are a lot of environmental constraints that cannot allow you to, you know, uh, ramp up and down your hydro as much as you would like. Uh, but but still, even within uh, the, the environmental constraints, there could be uh, there could be uh, improvements in how the hydro is used across the U.S. Uh, if, of course, some changes were made. In, in how uh, this, the, the markets were designed and how these these companies, well, these uh, the, 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 these uh, power administrations authorities in the U.S., how they operate their uh, their hydro resources could evolve over time and has to evolve over time. It's changing, but it's very slow to change as uh, markets between Canada and the U.S. are very slow to change. There, there can really be a lot of uh, improvements made. So uh, on this, I'll thank you. Uh, you can see the logos of my sponsors. I won't mention them, but thank you very much. And I look forward for a uh, discussion period. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to uh, answer them. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, our next panelist is Mike Della Pena. He's an electric power professional <clears throat> on building the grid of the future. Um, he currently serves as Google's carbon free energy project lead, working globally to develop innovative transactions and projects to achieve Google's ambitious goal of 24 seven carbon free energy by 2030 across their data center fleet. Prior to Google, Mike worked at uh, Pacific Gas and Electric for over seven years and focused on demand side management programs and energy storage project development. Mike completed his MBA at UC Berkeley High School of Business with a focus on finance. So take it away, Mike. Uh, thanks, Bob, and thanks everyone for calling in today. Um, Mike Delapenny here. I'm, I'm Google's uh, energy team within the data center organization. Uh, today, I want to talk to you a little bit about Google's uh, relatively new and ambitious 24-7 carbon-free energy goal for this decade, and then also talk a little bit uh, about our effort to deploy energy storage solutions for backup power at data centers. Um, to begin with, I wanted to set a little bit of context on Google's energy consumption. Um, so for folks not aware, which is probably very few on the phone, uh, the data center fleet across the world uses a fair amount of electricity uh, consumption, and Google has one of the largest fleets um, in the world. It's a global fleet, and what you can see on the right here is uh, Google's total consumption across those data centers over the past close to decade. Um, you see two things. You know, one is uh, consumption in aggregate amount is quite large, uh, close to 12 terawatt hours in the year 2019. Um, and it's growing at a very rapid clip, something close to about 20% per annum. Um, and that's a rate that we expect uh, to continue on in the near term. So what we have at Google is a, uh, a growing demand across our data center fleet that we're trying to match, which I'll talk with in a little bit more detail, with carbon-free energy supply at all times. Um, just to put that 12 terawatt hours in perspective, um, in 2019, it was actually more energy than was consumed in the entire state of Hawaii. Um, it's just a kind of a factoid to, to bring some greater context to, to Google's portfolio. Um, the portfolio of data centers, as I mentioned, is really a, a global uh, footprint. Um, as you can see here, uh, 21 locations spanned across almost all the continents. Um, I would say that what you can see here is, is indicative of, of total energy use, where we have the majority of energy use focused on uh, sites in the United States. Uh, with a, a pretty good chunk in, in Europe and then a smaller chunk in South America and in Asia Pacific. Um, what this presents for our team is a, is a really significant challenge as it relates to um, not only getting supply uh, to these data centers across dozens of, of utility and energy suppliers across the world, but also making sure that supply is a, is a sustainable supply. So when we think about um, when we're shopping for energy, what are our objectives? Uh, we think we we we'll break it down into three main buckets. One, we're obviously looking for something that's low cost. Um, certainly the, the electric bills associated with the 12 terawatt hours are pretty significant, um, even for a company the size of Google's. Uh, the, second, the second piece is looking for carbon-free energy supply, or, or I should say carbon light in most cases. Um, the third piece is looking for tariffs or uh, kind of regulatory regimes that are consumer focused. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, constructs that are really um, responsive to large energy user uh, preferences, you know, think uh, constructs that offer us different supply options, uh, enable to uh, have us as a customer 
uh, select what type of rate schedule, what type of supply makes the most sense given our particularities. Um, so to date, um, which some folks may be aware of, Google is really one of the largest corporate purchasers of renewable energy. Um, in the last few years, uh, we have procured enough renewable energy across our global portfolio uh, to at least match our annual consumption. And I want to break this down a little bit. Um, what you see is starting in 2012, uh, Google started contracting for renewable energy across the fleet. Um, these are primarily uh, virtual PPA constructs um, for facilities that are not oftentimes close to the data center themselves. Um, what we try and do then at the end of the year is sort of an accounting exercise to say of all of the demand that we consume. So in, uh, in 2019, that 12 terawatt, on, terawatt hour number, how do we compare that to the total number of uh, renewable energy certificates that were uh, procured as a means of these aggregate uh, virtual uh, power purchase agreements? This is the similar construct uh, that nearly every corporate uh, entity has used to date for renewable energy goals. And we've met this 100% uh, goal for the past uh, three years, including 2020. Um, so starting in 2017, uh, what the team has recognized in the past year is that um, this this goal really is sort of a uh, uh, tangential to the grid need, and certainly tangential to uh, what is needed to cons uh, to combat climate change on the electric front. Because we're not really fundamentally shifting anything on the grid, right? It's uh, looking at our overall consumption across the global fleet on an annual basis, looking at the overall uh, re renewable production across the global fleet and making sure that uh, the second number is at least as high as the first number. Um, those resources are obviously producing at different times than uh, consumption is taking place. Those resources are pr producing in different regions and that consumption is taking place, um, which is why we start have started pivoting to a 24 seven carbon free energy construct, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, so, as we've set out in a goal, uh, <clears throat> set out externally in September. Uh, Google's goal by 2030 is to go beyond 100% renewable, what I just described in the previous slide, to move into a world where we're sourcing clean energy, carbon-free energy for Google's operations in all places at all times. And to take a quick look at that, um, here's kind of a quick pictograph of what supply may look like for our Iowa data center. Um, and so what you're seeing here is uh, in green, uh, the energy supply that's say contracted from a, from a wind farm. Um, so when we look at a given data center, we define it in a region, um, and at least in the United States, that's defined as a, as a balancing authority region. And we say, what is all the demand for that data center in that region compared to all of the specific um, contracted supply in that region? Um, and what are the grid dynamics uh, in terms of dispatch within that balancing authority? And we try and take a look within each hour of each year, um, what percentage of energy consumed by the data center um, is attributable to carbon free energy sources. And so when we look at an hour uh, where the green line is quite a bit above the black, uh, black being the overall consumption by the data center, um, we don't credit that uh, as sort of extra. We would say that's excess carbon free energy and we're not able to bank that output for the next hour. And so fundamentally what we're trying to do with our goal, 24 seven carbon free energy goal, is fill in all the parts that are shown in black here over the course of a, of a given year. Um, and that's that's a pretty fundamental challenge that I'll tell you, frankly, we we do not have entirely figured out, but are looking forward to working with the likes of uh, folks on this phone, uh, utility suppliers and uh, electricity um, retailers across the world to, to figure out how we can move this direction by 2030. A little bit of additional color on how we calculate these these hourly metrics, and then I'll get to talking about uh, backup at the data center environment. Um, when we look at each hour uh, within a given region, what we first look at is to see if we have any sort of um, contracted carbon free energy, uh, one of those virtual PPAs that I mentioned earlier in my comments. Um, should we have no, not, no output in that region, which is the case in certain regions, uh, then we would look at the data we have for dispatch of the, uh, the local balancing authority. Um, and we would pr prioritize uh, and look at how much of that stack is carbon free energy. Uh, so, for example, that bar on the on the left hand side, we might say, okay, there's some hydro output, there's some nuclear output, and there's some wind output uh, during that hour. That constitutes about a third of the overall grid production in that hour. Uh, so that green bar, as you can see, is maybe about a third of the overall consumption, with the gray bar being everything that's not carbon free generated by the grid. 
Um, there may be uh, regions where we do have contracted renewables, and so we account for those. This would be the second bar from the left. Um, so we would first account for, say, the wind virtual PPA, which is shown in blue, and then for the remainder, uh, look at, again, what the balancing authority kind of production mix is and attribute carbon-free energy versus not within that hour, so matching our consumption to the production data we have on hand for that hour. As I mentioned in the previous slide, there may be hours where uh, we've contracted for more supply than we can consume, which is shown in the, the tall blue bar with the light blue top. Um, and in that case, we would just give ourselves credit for 100% carbon-free energy in that in that hour, um, with no ability to bank that that overall uh, sorry that light blue mark uh, above the the horizontal line, unless uh, we were able to store that in some type of energy storage system, which you know we we definitely see some some advantages to in in the near term and and definitely in the longer term. So to the extent we're able to pair an energy storage system with that renewable resource and soak up, if you will, that excess carbon-free energy and use it in a different hour, then we'd be able to reduce the, the size of the gray bars on the left and the right. Um, ideally, where we wanna get in the, far, in the future is all, all hours of every year uh, across our data center fleet looking like the farthest bar to the right, where we have some combination of contracted carbon-free energy and some uh, aspect or some uh, delivery by the grid for carbon-free energy matching our overall demand in that hour. Um, and that's what we're, we're charging forward uh, to, to do by the end of this decade. Okay, so with that, I um, wanted to share a little bit more detail on our plans to deploy energy storage backup uh, at data centers. My, my, my previous comments were primarily framed around um, primary electricity consumption for the data center. Um, and that is, that is our main goal, right? From an, a total um, energy content or energy consumption perspective, we're using a rounding error worth of uh, energy in order to power certain backup diesel systems when the grid goes down. The really big fish is figuring out how our primary energy consumption from the grid, from virtual PPAs is carbon free. Um, but we also recognize that for a variety of reasons, we want to have a, uh, we'll call it carbon light or carbon free ultimately backup power solution. Um, so for those that not familiar, um, each, each data center within sort of the, the hyperscaler world um, deploys basically one megawatt of backup diesel generators for each megawatt of data center capacity. Um, and if you think back to the 12 terawatt hours that I mentioned early on, you can get to the fact that there's an awful lot of capacity out there, right? Google's only one of many hyperscaler players. Um, so there's a ton of backup diesel generators just sitting on these sites. Um, they don't run an awful lot, right? I mean, there aren't very many outages that require them to run. Uh, but they do need to be cycled for maintenance. Um, and frankly, in areas like the United States, um, citing so many diesel generators in a given, uh, given parcel of land, um, even if they don't run very often, uh, presents some significant permitting challenges. And so for cost reasons and for environmental permitting reasons, um, not, not to mention just the 24-7 the carbon-free energy goal I mentioned, uh, Google has been investigating an alternative to diesel generators and working on deploying a battery energy storage solution to replace these diesel generators. Um, so for folks that may have seen late 2020, uh, we announced plans for our first ever uh, backup battery energy storage system re to replace diesel generators. It's a project that will be going in at our Belgium data center facility, which is shown in the, the photo on the right. It also happens to have a, a solar uh, farm plugged right in. Um, the team there is really familiar with uh, kind of unique and innovative projects like this, and so they were they were really well suited for the task. Um, the battery there will be doing two things uh, for a use case perspective. One is uh, obviously working to provide backup power should the uh, transmission connection to the data center go down. That's that's anticipated to be very infrequent. And the second piece, uh, which we're we're quite excited about is we're utilizing that same energy storage resource to participate in the local uh, grid services markets. So in this case, uh, the, the grid market operator is called ALIA, uh, E-L-I-A, and they have a variety of uh, products that can be um, delivered by energy storage resources that look something like, they have different names, but in the United States, it'd be something like frequency regulation, spinning reserve, and, and non-spinning reserve. And so with the battery, when it's not providing, uh, for backup power, we've provisioned a, a certain portion of the state of charge to provide grid services, and that certain portion of the state of charge will be providing something like uh, frequency regulation and something like spinning reserve 
getting compensated for that, which helps us uh, subsidize the overall cost of the installation. So when we look forward um, and we see, you know, the cost trajectories of specifically lithium ion installations and the ability to utilize these resources uh, in an emissions free way to generate value um, from from providing grid services, we see a relatively near term opportunity to be able to deploy um, hybrid and hopefully ultimately um, entirely battery based backup solutions at our data center fleet. So that's what what keeps me busy. Um, and with that, I will. Hand it back over to Bob to see if we have any further questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Um, a lot to chew on there. Um, let me just say we'll we'll move into the Q and A piece, and you know we're using Slido. I've been monitoring it here. Um, let's ask all the panelists to put their mugs on the screen. And uh, my plan for right now is just to start. Um, sort of at the top, the ones that have been upvoted. This is an easy one for Rick. Um, at a max of 50 cycles per year, this would be for the, the OEC um, project. At 50 cycles per year, what is the life expectancy of the battery? Oh, there we go. It's right on there. Right. Yep. Look at that. Um, yeah. <clears throat> that's a great question. So the the term sheet, it's interesting that it light, uh, puts out 50 cycles per year. That's a little, you know, that's quite a bit less than what we normally see in energy storage agreements, which is about one sort of a daily cycle. Um, and I'll note that the term sheet, you know, the, the term of the contract is only 10 years. Um, so, you know, I don't have the details of the battery technology or the battery provider or what the, you know, the commercial details between Vistra would be in their battery provider, um, but those is an interesting. I'm not quite. I don't quite understand why PG&E would have put this kind of cycle limitation of 50 cycles. Like normally in energy storage agreements, we don't like. You know, we normally normally the the off taker of the of the energy storage agreement would, you know, limit to something like a daily cycle. So the so the you know the owner could sort of look at the at the wear and tear on the battery. So it's interesting that they put something like 50 here. Um, I think that's probably just because it's because of the product that they're offering being contingency relief, it's expected to cycle a lot less. Okay. Why don't you um, dispatch the second one there since it's uh, yeah. since it's related. So, and I can do the, yeah, and I can enjoy, do the one further down. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Kaiso did the studies to, um, and I think one of my main points is I think this is where we can, where Kaiso really gets credit. Kaiso again, the California Independent System Operator, doing a really good job of being specific about the need. Um, so it turns out the need's actually a five-hour need. So even though the battery, you know, most batteries are four, you know, the batteries here are actually four-hour batteries, but they're actually going to be dispatched in a, um, at a, a as five-hour batteries, and obviously you can do that just by lowering the lowering the capacity and letting them um it, so it's a five hour need uh and that was really determined by um you know by kaiso in their study and looking at and you know doing the power flow analysis and figuring out like what how how what a battery would need to do to sort of meet the contingency requirements okay um Let's jump down to the uh, one for Mike. Let's see who's running the slide up on the screen. Is that you, Ryan? Can you scroll down? Yeah. Um, yeah. The, it's from Rajat. Uh, Mike, what does Google's total hourly load distribution look like? Are you, and are you trying to source 100% renewables locally in that region? Yeah, good question. So I'll take it in, in two parts. Uh, one, I interpret it as sort of what does the load shape or load factor look like? And for, for most data centers, Google's included, it's essentially flat load factor equal to one. Um, into the second part of the question, are we looking to source uh, within region? Yes, that is the goal. So by the end, by the end of the decade, we're looking to source for each hour within that region, which there may be multiple data centers within the region enough carbon free energy either from the grid writ large or from contracts in order to match the data center consumption in each hour hope that helps answer the question okay um all right that next question down um 
think that would be open to everybody. And I'm not sure I yeah. under the uh, understand the question all that well, but maybe one of you do. Well, Bob, yeah, I think all of us should answer this one because I think it's kind of a broad question. And I think I'm not exactly sure what Rajat's asking here about how you model energy storage for a larger balancing authority. But I think that comes down to what are the, you know, what are the services that you're trying to provide, right? So I think, um, you know, I think Mike and Pierre were talking about really energy services, um, but are there, you know, so right now what we're seeing is a lot of the uh, planning models on the generation side. So folks like Duke in the Carolinas would use a planning model uh, in their IRP, which, you know, they just filed an IRP late last year integrated resource plan um, where they looked at, at, at adding a lot of batteries. Um, and in that case, you're looking at really at batteries at serving two, two things, right? Capacity and energy. And one of the things that we see is really important is that the, the planning models of the past just really didn't know how to deal with uh, energy limited resources like batteries um, and did a very poor job of incorporating batteries correctly. Um, and even the newer models are still struggling a little bit to really, you know, to really kind of optimize the system and really deploy batteries in a, in a thoughtful way. And so people are kind of rushing to update their software. For instance, you know, NREL's kind of flagship capacity expansion software that does national studies called Reads. They recently updated it just in the fall. So it now deploys two hour batteries and then four hour batteries and then six hour batteries and then eight hour batteries. Um, and I think, you know, and, and, you know, when Rajat brought up Duke specifically, and I think this is a big, you know, this is one of the big things that was a, a little bit of a contention between Duke and a lot of the stakeholders in the Carolinas around Duke's plans for uh, batteries versus, I think, you know, Duke, Duke saw a more limited role for batteries, whereas others see a more broader role. Um, so I think it's, it's, you know, we're still learning and we're, we need to update our tools. We need to update the way we think. Um, and I think that also, you know, really with paired resources as well. So batteries plus solar, um, and to some extent, you know, also batteries plus wind or batteries plus thermal resources. Um, so hybrid resources have, you know, pretty strong, very strong capabilities that are, again, difficult to model, difficult to plan for, uh, and I think we need to do better. Um, yeah. So anyways, I, I don't want to talk too long. I should let Pierre and, and Mike also respond, because I think this is a good question. Gentlemen. Go ahead, Pierre. Yeah, well, you know, I, I think in the framework where more central planning was made or is made, then it's easier to model uh, storage. But, uh, but, you know, we tend to have markets where less central planning is made. So, uh, and then we'll let, you know, individual, uh, market operators to, to bring their solution. Then, then, then it's, it's good because it increases competition, but, uh, it's harder to, to plan the whole system and in a way that is optimal for, for the, the, the system. So I would. I would say that uh, we, you know, to some extent, to ideally plan storage, we would need to extend the areas we are looking at, and uh, we should put all solutions, transmission, storage, and generation, uh, and demand response uh, on equal footing. But that's that's difficult to to implement in um, in real settings. So, so that that's my short answer to the question. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm going to. Um... I'm going to pull rank here and, and turn what you said around a little bit because we have our current processes with the horizons uh, that are established. And, you know, we tend to reliability needs and then we look at uh, sort of economic and policy, but we do it incrementally on, on relatively short cycles. So if, if we're going to transform the grid to 100% clean electricity, you know, over three decades, two decades, how do we avoid the situation where the solution that may look good for the near term uh, is not the one we want in the longer term? Well, so, so that's, that's, that's the 
key question. Uh, thank you, Bob, for asking it. Uh, but that's where our societies aren't very good because we are not good at planning longer term issues. And there are so many uh, political fights and vested interests by different actors to look at the short term options and prevent the, the macro and significant changes we need to implement. You know, in, in the kind of model that I and result that I showed you, you know, we would need to operate the Northeast region in a totally different way to act, basically be able to decarbonize at the minimum cost. So we need much more collaboration and, and discussions and and that's really a social problem, a political problem that is really hard to, to tackle. Yeah. Okay, I apologize for interjecting that. Let's let's work through the list. We're doing very well on time. So um, the uh, question I'm staring at on the screen is why would the customers prefer large scale macro grid storage solutions to small scale micro grid, possibly off grid storage solutions? Anyone have a thought about that? Yeah, maybe I can take a crack at it as the end use consumer of the group. Um, I would say a couple things, you know, and, and I saw a question down below that maybe I can knock out a twofer here. Question was, as it relates to, does, does Google just sign uh, PPAs or does it own any, any uh, renewable resources? The short answer is, uh, with the exception of that small solar facility I flashed on the screen, we basically don't own any of the renewable resources, uh, all offtake agreements. Um, and, you know, I think the, the reason for that really comes down to, um, you know, what is our core business model, which is not being an owner operator of power generation assets. Um, we do that because we have to, to some degree with our, with our diesel generator fleet, and hopefully that will be a battery energy storage fleet that needs to be co-located with the energy or with the data center um, for reliability purposes. Um, but, you know, when we just think about as a company where we want to put our time, effort and capital. Um, running our own systems, you know, in small scale, kind of pulling ourselves off grid is not necessarily the number one focus. Um, and so when we're thinking about trying to achieve our carbon free energy goals, we're happy to let developers and IPPs who do this sort of thing to make their living, uh, take the lead. And then we just, uh, benefit from signing a, an off take agreement with them. Okay. I think that relates to the question, uh, further down and let me see if I can find that. Uh, why does Google. In his 24 7 plan, not look at the value of transmission, import, low cost, high quality renewables from other regions. And it seems to me that kind of lines up with what you just said. Yeah, I can make a quick comment on that. Transmission, especially inter regional transmission, is definitely very much on our radar for uh, you know cost effective way to achieve our goals. Um, because as we think about um, the challenge, I think the challenge becomes all the more intense the smaller the geographic scope of our, of our solutioning, right? If we, if we said, well, it's a global challenge, it'd be a heck of a lot easier to, to get to something that works. Um, and so when we think about big interregional projects, which are often talked about, but not implemented for a whole variety of reasons, it's probably its own, its own ESIG session. Uh, we do see a lot of, uh, potential benefit from, from such projects that can help us, um, tap, uh, kind of uncorrelated grid carbon free energy hours within a certain region. Um, and so that's something that we're definitely actively exploring. Okay. Anybody else have a comment on that before I select the next question? I would just add that, you know, in the end, it will be a matter of cost, uh, you know, in, in, in the kind of results that I showed, you know, it's much cheaper to have this micro grid storage options uh, through hydro reservoir than the micro scale uh, uh, storage. So, so if we can design a system that is less costly, but provide the same services, then, you know, it's better for everyone. Okay, here's here's a uh, an easy one for Mike. How much of energy or data center energy use for Google is cooling? Is that significant? If that is significant, why aren't more data centers located in colder regions? Um, good question. I don't know it off the top of my head. It's somewhere in between insignificant and not a ton <laughs> relative to the critical load. The majority of the load is the actual IT and compute load. Um, we do have uh, you know a couple. Uh, data centers in, in very cool regions, uh, one up in the Nordics, where we've sort of instituted unique um, cooling regimes. But the, the load is for, for cooling and, and is significant, but but nothing compared to the compute load. Okay, very good. Um, so we got that one. My screen keeps jumping and I lose rows. 
Okay, so Rick, is, is Cal ISO specifying um, battery energy storage systems with grid forming inverters? Did that enter into the um, the requirements for the facility that you told us about? Uh, Bob, not at this time. Um, I don't know if Kaiso is looking at grid forming inverters at yet. I think I know. Mm -hmm. uh, I know ERCOT is is got a project with GE and NREL to look at grid forming inverters, but um, you know, I think in this in this case, if this this specific project that I was talking about, you know, you have an inverter that you have a system that runs very infrequently to support a contingency that probably would be the last place you'd put a grid forming inverter unless you were going to have that storage system do black start. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think the short answer is no. And the project I talked about would not be a good place to put grid forming inverters. If you were thinking about it, it would be more around if you had a place where you needed voltage support, you yeah. need a black start, you need some other yeah. type of okay, or, so, or weak grids, weak grid support. So very related. How does that facility replace the 160 plus megawatts of gas generation? Given that the nameplate was, uh, I forget, it was what, 25. Yeah. Well, good, good question. Um, so I just found out, and I think it's not, it's not well publicized, but it's actually really only, it's really replacing one of the three units. So there, one of the units is retiring. Ah. Two, two units are, uh, two units of the jet fuel are going to jet fuel peaker are going to continue uh, to operate, be in service. Okay. Um, and, okay. And my question: You mentioned aero derivatives; those are old aero derivatives, correct? Very old. Yeah, yeah like because GE came out with an aero derivative 15 years ago that was reasonably efficient. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's see. Okay. For Mike, when you refer to hyperscale assets, how big of a range are you talking about? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know if there is a kind of industry standard term. Uh, for hyperscalers, but it you know typically refers to the the big cloud players and the digital realty type firms that are providing really large scale. Um, on the power side, you know you're talking tens of megawatts of demand. In some cases, up into the hundreds of megawatts of demand. Um, just to give you kind of a general general ballpark. Okay, um, Ryan, why don't you continue to scroll down my. Personal view keeps kind of jumping around, and I'm scared I'm going to miss something. Um, well, let's see. Okay, actually, Bob, can I can I pick one to answer? No, um, absolutely, absolutely. I think somebody asked. You know, somebody asked. Storage uh, seems to be an inherently bespoke technology. How can a more generic planning methodology be developed? Um, and I think this is a great question, and this is the question that I was trying to answer. Um, and I was actually, this is the question I was actually trying to ask, you know, all of you. So I, I appreciate you asked it back to me. I think the first thing, and I, and I should have said this in my presentation is really doing a really good job of identifying a need and making sure that the need is identified, whether it's a grid need, um, you know, like a specific transmission need, whether it's an energy market need, you know, that we define the need in a, in a high enough level way that many things can um, can plug in and meet that. You see, I think a lot of times if you think about like our energy markets, capacity markets or transmission planning, like the need has always been sort of defined in terms of the solutions that we are, the solution set that we already have. So we've, you know, we call, look, you know, Mike said spin and non-spin, right? Like, well, you know, no, things don't necessarily need to spin anymore, right? So like, are we creating market products at our at our markets? Are we creating transmission solutions that are kind of, you know, we 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 create the solution in the in the frame of the uh, the solution set that we already have, or are we just defining the need and saying, hey, this is the grid need, and like maybe because I think storage sort of is this many-headed Hydra that can do lots and lots of things, and um, we don't want to sort of just say, oh, okay, only we can only. We need a peaker plant, or we need a new line, or we need a statcom. Um, so I think that's the first thing is really being generic about describing the need. So then we can have a more 
um, we, you know, storage can sort of plug in potentially to be that solution. Okay. Um, I was going to ask this to Pierre before, and I, I see it here on the list. Um, <clears throat> in your presentation up front, you talked about water stored in cubic kilometers. Um, what, what sort of fraction of that water volume is actually usable? And in Quebec, are there any concerns with regard to coupled reservoirs and those sorts of things that I, I in my opinion, uh, severely constrain our hydro flexibility in the US? So, so there are constraints. Of course, you cannot, you know, drain these reservoirs uh, down to, to zero. Um, in Quebec, just to give a perspective, you know, uh, Hydro-Quebec has 176 uh, terawatt hour of storage, and then they can, they at the low, so that, that's the maximum capacity. Uh, they don't publish uh, what's their lowest level, but their lowest level is probably around 100 terawatt hours. So, so out of 176, they probably go down to maybe 90 or 100 terawatt hour. So that gives a, a perspective, and the total generation in Quebec is around 200 terawatt hours. So. So more or less, you know, there's there would be in principle enough storage for about one year of use, but but that would be without any rain. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, and in other places, you know, there would be more constraints, but still some availability for and flexibility in these dams. Okay. Um, and just a quick follow up. There was a question with regard to the negative correlation of wind and hydro. And mm -hmm. you, what do you consider the sweet spot to maximize utilization of combined wind and water? Then, yeah, I saw that question and I don't have an answer for that because it would really depend on the specifics. And uh, I wanted to, I, I wanted to, uh, to show the statistics because it really shows that when you you integrate the markets, hydropower is able to follow load and 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 be a complement to wind, um, in in a, in a in a much better way. So um, so so I think that's the the point of you know wind and and, and hydro can complement each other in a nice way uh, if tra enough transmission is there and that can you know help wind and decrease the need for new storage because that the hydro storage is already there. Uh, but what is exactly the sweet spot? You know, that depends on what's available and what's feasible. You know, maybe ideally it would be, you know, minus one. You know, it would be, we would stop hydro when wind is there. And, but that depends on the cost, the relative cost of hydro storage, wind. So, so, okay. so there's no definite answer. Thank you. Uh, question for Mike. How many hours of battery backup power does the data center require? The question was posted, and then I have kind of a follow on question to that. Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't get into that level of detail. Um, so I'll say that as a somewhat limited, but as a general industry standard, uh, we install 24 hours worth of diesel fuel backup as sort of the normal hyperscaler standard. And uh, what we are installing is quite a bit less than that, because you might say, well, that's going to be uh, not very cost effective and you would be correct to do that with batteries. Um, I'm not able to tell you the precise duration. It's pretty short. Um, but what we are looking at is really a combination of the battery with a intelligent software layer that's that's taking a look and saying, OK, when there is a uh, an outage on the utility side, uh, let us run on the, the diesel generators plus the batteries for some period of time. As we reduce the load, as we uh, modulate our consumption on the back end, such that when we uh, have run out of duration of the battery, uh, we're now at a point where um, the load is not going to outstrip the remain the capacity of the remaining diesel generators. Um, so it's sort of a hybrid solution. I didn't get into it in a ton of detail because it's somewhat internal, um, but you can think of it as a relatively shorter duration with the ion battery paired with less. I should say fewer uh, diesel generators that works in concert with the software layer. Okay, so in, in your data centers, is there, let's just say you lose a data center, is that a matter of basically rerouting traffic to other data centers? Uh, yeah, good is, question. 
Uh, the data center fleet, as I've come to know it, is actually um, pretty heter pretty heterogeneous. Um, and even within a given building, there are uh, different kind of combinations uh, or sort of subsets of, of, of compute. Um, so there could be cases where if we lose, say, a building, that's easily failed over to, say, another building in the region. There are definitely cases where that's not possible. And the, the machines that are operating in that building uh, are only there, or they're or they're perhaps in a region where latency would be too too uh, too far or too too long to be acceptable. Um, so the team's always looking out for these sorts of contingencies and running reliability analysis to make sure that's not the case. But it isn't always the situation where we can just fail over gracefully to another data center. Okay. F a final question on the data centers. I mean, you, you're talking about battery backup for the entire facility or or backup. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you still internal to the facility uh, utilize uh, universe uh, uninterruptible power supplies and that kind of stuff? Uh, yeah, that that this would be what I'm referring to is uh, we're very precise to say this is for backup generator replacement. So yes, we still have a UPS. Uh, the sources are the grid writ large. Then if there's an outage, you write on the UPS for a bit as your gen spin up. In this case, gens plus batteries, and then we cut over to that solution. Okay. Good questions. Thank you. All right, let's see. And uh, panelists are welcome to peruse the list if you have it up to and uh, pick off some of these we haven't uh, gotten to. We have probably another five to eight minutes. Um, yep. I oh, okay. Go ahead. I was just going to oh, say sorry about. One. One of the screen looking at me about transmission to provide a physical path from source to load. I can cover that one. Okay. Got four votes. Um, perhaps I wasn't clear, but we're not looking for a direct physical co connection from resources to the data center, uh, which seems to be implied in the question. Uh, what we are looking for is a balance on an hourly and regional basis. And what I mean by that is if we have a, say, a contracted wind asset within our same balancing authority as the data center, we're going to count that as sort of virtually connected, if you will. Um, so we're not requiring a direct transmission line connection from that uh, data center to the wind farm, which could be many miles away. Okay. Uh, another quick one for you, Mike. What state of charge is reserved for uh, backup power? You're talking about the uh, data center in Europe uh, yeah. where you participate in a grid services markets. Uh, half, and that's that's reserved at all times. So you, we can, you can think of our... Uh, area of modulation is sort of from 100% state of charge down to down to 50. Okay. And it just slipped in. How does that, given you're doing that in Europe, how does that affect your value proposition for storage? Assuming that, let's say, you didn't have that opportunity to uh, provide those services. Is it significant, not significant? How much does yeah. it subsidize what you're doing? Yeah, it definitely, it definitely helps with the costs. I will say that, uh, like most, you know, um, power generation related business cases, it's all really dependent on your forward curve assumptions and how many years you're willing to give yourself credit for. So the truth is we don't, we don't fully know right now, but, um, we, we see there to be some relatively low cost opportunity to at least get in the market, um, giving us an ability to earn revenues, which, which offset the costs. And it's, it's a meaningful, but not huge amount compared to the upfront CapEx. Okay. Um, anybody else want to jump in? Sure. Bob, I if, I, if I Rick. can just answer one that <clears throat> somebody asked if PV hybrid was considered for the site. And the answer was absolutely. So there was a lot of work and thought um, early on to try and figure out how to actually get solar generation into the load pocket as well for to charge the batteries. Um, and, you know, ultimately that wasn't chosen. And like I also mentioned that there was a Sunrun project that was going to be part of the project. E EBCE actually contracted separately with Sunrun um, to do about a 500 kilowatt um, of battery capacity, along, um, which is all behind the meter uh, that's coupled with behind the meter customer sided solar, um, about, I think, two megawatts of solar, 500 kilowatts of, of battery. But I think that's a big part of like what we'd have, you know, that would make would have made the project more creative if we could do um, kind of more of a virtual power plant with actual charging energy as well as 
uh, not just not just the battery. Okay. So there was a question on uh, Hydro Quebec plans for more uh, hydro on the scope of uh, James B. And and the idea is the no uh, at the current uh, time you know there's no there's no new hydropower big dams that are planned in Quebec. Uh, there will be wind developments, and then when we look at the cost, the relative cost of wind and hydro, it's really wind that will um, that will be installed in Quebec because there there are good opportunities. Uh, but so, so there could be hydro developments, but the market would have to change significantly before there's new hydro in uh, in Quebec or Canada. Yeah, although Manitoba Hydro is proceeding with some development, correct? Yeah, no, there are development. I mean, currently, you know, uh, British Columbia has, a, I think, 800 megawatt site C uh, project. Uh, Manitoba Hydro, I think, has a project too. And, and uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, they have... Uh, a big problem with Muskrat Falls, which is a hydro project that you know costs twice. So, I mean, is totally over cost and uh, and they have a lot of delays and a lot of issues with that. But there could be more hydro development in Canada, definitely. But the you know the market could not sustain the prices at this point for yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Let's see a couple more minutes, and then we'll have to sign off. Uh, let's see. That one. Oh, Maybe. okay. Yeah. Pierre, what yep. have you explored what market rule changes would need to happen in New York and um, New England uh, to incent the options you have studied? So, so not directly, but what we what we realize is that you know in what in our model, which is a optimization model, is a, a capacity expansion and dispatch model for the year. Um, Basically, uh, incentives are not uh, current incentives in the market are not aligned with what would be needed, you know, to reach the low lowest cost solution our model uh, presents. So, so there, basically, um, you know, if if there's more transmission lines uh, and, and prices will go down in New York, for example, and for exports, that will be problematic for Hydro Quebec. Uh, because well, because Quebec exports will be will become cheaper as there's more transmission, and it, although it's good for everyone, you know the incentive for for uh, exporters aren't there. So you would have to to have longer term agreements to make sure that you know you have long term contracts for transmission and uh, balancing uh, and storage opportunities. So you would need to have long term contracts. So current markets wouldn't allow these solutions to emerge naturally you would need to have longer term uh, contracts and agreements to make sure that everyone you know uh, wins and and we get all to the least cost solution okay thank you and and rick um question on the the sizing of the battery uh, just I, you may, you may have you may have touched on it but how was the right. four hours determined what sort of approach analytical approach do they use if any to to sort of get to that yeah good question bob you know i I'm honestly don't know the details my sense is that the five so it's actually even though the batteries are four hours i think i mentioned that the need is actually a five hour need um my sense is that's really just covers the the sort of the load right so you know kaiso looked at the looked at the load curve and looked at looked at the you know if they if you know this transmission line failed it um, that they would need five hours of capacity from the battery to essentially provide that uh, capacity until the load fell off. So, like looking at the, you know, if you think about California, sort of peak load is really kind of four to nine p.m. Um, yeah. is the where is where the layer curve is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, that's when the that's when the duck quacks. Yeah. Say. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we're just about to the end and I, I'm gonna gonna wrap this up. We will circulate the questions and um, try to address them and then send out a follow-up email. I wanna thank our panelists for the great presentations and the discussion we had for them staying on time to give us the full 30 minutes to discuss. Um, I think the session covered some insights into energy storage from different angles, all of them very interesting and potentially convergent at some point down the road. Um, I need to remind you that the spring work 
workshop sessions are not done yet. They're being held on Tuesdays and Thursdays through April 8th. Uh, there's a session this Thursday on the wonderful world of transmission chaired by uh, Wayne Galley of Next Era Energy. Again, no charge for the sessions. You're all invited to attend. And of course, you can get further information on registration from the ESIG website. That's ESIG.energy. Um, you can also sort of look at what's happened already, what you missed, and maybe maybe partake. So again, <clears throat> thank you for uh, calling in. Please stay safe. Let's get through this thing, and then Charlie can cook up a nice resort for us to meet at in the fall. Um, we'll see you on Thursday. Bye now. Great. Thanks. Thank you.